Hello, grade 10 students. Good evening. I'm Miss Rana Andrea Antamari, your English teacher. And for this week's lesson, we'll explore more on how to critic a literary selection using the structuralist and moralist approaches. Come on, study with me and explore more about the topic. Good day, grade 10 students. I'm Rana Andrea Antamayo, your English teacher. And for you to get a hint of what our today's discussion would be, take a look at these pictures. I'll give you five seconds to have those pictures in mind. One, two, three, four, five. Time's up. What do those pictures signify? Think again, students. What do those pictures signify? How can those pictures give us an idea on how to critic a literary selection? I'll give you a hint to help you answer what each of the picture signifies. For the first picture, what did you see in that picture? What did you see in the first picture earlier? That's right, there was a building. Another answer? Hmm, okay. It seems that the building is just newly constructed or they are in the process of constructing the building. That's a good idea as well. Here's a hint. The word starts with letter S followed by T and then I think it's easy for you now to guess what that first word is. A word to describe the first picture is one, two, three, four, five. Here it is. That is the word structure. Oh, I think some of you already got the answer be before I showed you this slide. Very good. To all who got the hint, or who, to all who have figured out what that first word is, and that word can be used to describe the first picture. Let's have the second picture. Mm, I think it's quite challenging for some of the students to get what the second picture signifies or what the second picture represents. Let's take a look at this hint. Here it is. The word or the, the word I would like you to guess to signify or describe the second picture is, okay, that word represents people's perspectives of others' actions and way of thinking that starts with letter M. M, the third word is R, and the last word is L. So that's a five-letter word. Hmm, think of what that word is. Think, think, think. I can give you five seconds to think of the answer. Or to help you more to guess what that word is, let me give you an example. You have a friend and you had known that his father committed a crime. Now, I will not be specific of what that crime is. Would you report your best friend's father to the police? If you are contemplating on what to do on that scenario or situation, then that would appeal to your one, two, three, four, five. That would appeal to your moral. Very good. A few of the students were able to think or come up with the word that represents the second picture. So we have two words. The first word is structure and the second word is moral. 
So let's proceed to the next part of the discussion. Okay, because you have guessed those two words right, and you have guessed those two words correctly, we have now our target for this lesson. So everyone is expected to join or participate actively in our discussion and in our activities on how to critic a literary selection using a structuralist approach and a moralist approach. Let's proceed. What is structuralism? Can anyone here in the class uh, describe what structuralism is? You can see a very simple definition here on our slide. Structuralism or formalism is an approach to literary analysis grounded in structural linguistics or the science of language. For you to learn more on how to use a structuralist approach in critiquing a literary selection, we'll have another activity for you to learn or know more about the topic. I will help you and guide you on learning more about that. So don't you worry. Let's have a simple definition of moralism. A moral or philosophical approach takes the position that a larger function of literature is to teach morality and probe philosophical issues such as ethics, religion, or the nature of humanity. That expresses most of what I mentioned earlier in my example. Do you still remember? If your best friend's dad committed a crime, would you report your best friend's father to the police? That would appeal to your sense of morality. Before we discuss the two approaches in critiquing a literary selection, I would like to get ideas from my students of what they think about literature or how would you give a description of literature. What is literature? Hmm, let's think for five more seconds. One, two, three, four, five. Thank you for giving your responses. You can always write your responses in the comment section of this video. Okay, literature is life. Literature mirrors different aspects of an individual's life, whether that be sad, gloomy, happy, exciting, or whether that be a very challenging or melancholic part of your life that would still be described or expressed by literature. Through the use of literature, different individuals have lightened up all their emotions. The first thing that literature provides us is the channel or a way for us to express our emotions. We can always express how happy we are or how contented we are with the lives that we are enjoying today. You might be experiencing challenges, but always have this mindset that those challenges will bring about opportunities in your lives. Literature acts as our teacher, advisor, and provider. It provides us a feeling of satisfaction whenever we express or deliver our emotions. Literature teaches us a way of life. It also helps us to envision the future. That is what literature is. This time, we'll learn the approaches 
in critiquing a literary selection. Now, not all works of literature will be expressed in the same manner for all of the readers or listeners. It may reach you on a different manner or on a different aspect, depending on your perspectives, insights, and perceptions of what life is or how you understood a given literary selection. Now, let's study the first approach. The first approach is a structuralist approach, commonly known as the structuralism. In analyzing a literary selection using a structuralist approach, we'll look at the literary selections structure. We'll look at the words, how those words are formed, how those words are grouped, and the pattern used in the expression of the writer or author's emotions. So always remember to make it easy for you to analyze a literary selection using the structuralist approach. You would always look into the structure. Let's have an easier term, the pattern with which the words were, were expressed by the author. Before we apply the structuralist approach, to critiquing or analyzing a literary selection, let us watch a video, Sonnet 18 by William Shakespeare. Are you all ready to watch the video? Let's go! Sonnet 18 Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May. And summer's lease hath all too short a day. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, And often is his gold complexion dimmed. And every fair from fair sometime declines, By chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, Nor lose possession of that fair thou owest, Nor shall death break thou wanderest in his shade, When in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe, or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. In analyzing a literary selection using the structuralist or formalist approach, mm -hmm. the critic may analyze the number of lines, sentences, <gasps> words, rhyme scheme, meter, stances, yeah. and sound devices. One of the things that we will focus more in this discussion would be how to analyze the structure of a literary selection using the stances. Stances are visual grouping of lines. A group of two lines is called a couplet. A three-line stanza is called a tercet. A four-line stanza is quatrain. And a five-line stanza is quintet. Two other common lengths are a sestet, six lines, and an octave, eight lines. In poetry, a stanza is a group set of lines within a poem, usually set off from others by a blank line or indentation. Stanzas can have regular rhyme and metrical schemes. Though stanzas are not strictly required to have either, there are many unique forms of stances as what I've mentioned. We have couplet, tercet, quatrain, quintet, sestet, and octave. Take a look at these examples. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day, though art more lovely and more temperate? That two-line stanza is what we call a couplet. Take a look at the next example. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Who art more lovely and more temperate? Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May. So that tree line stanza is what we call a tercet. The other example is Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? 
who art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's leaves had all too short a date. The four-line stanza that we have there is termed as quatrain. That stanza is called a quatrain. So we have a two-line stanza, a couplet, a three-line stanza, a tercet, and a four-line stanza, a quatrain. Let's take a look at the other example here. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Who art more lovely and more temperate? Rough winds do shape the darling buds of May, and summer's leaves had all too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dim. And every fair from fair sometime declines, by chance or nature's changing course and trim. We have eight lines there, that is an eight line stanza, and we call that an octave. So we have couplet, tercet, quatrain, and an octave. Another thing that we should be looking into whenever we critic a literary selection using a structuralist or a formalist approach is its rhyme scheme. Rhyme scheme is the pattern of rhyme that comes at the end of each verse or line of poetry. You learn more by looking at the example that we have here. In the Sonnet 18 by William Shakespeare, as you can see, the patterns are encoded by letters of the alphabet, lines designated with the same letter rhyme with each other. For example, the rhyme scheme A, B, A, B means the first and third lines of a stanza or the A's rhyme with each other and the second line rhymes with the fourth line or the B's rhyme together. In the example above, day and may sound together, hence they are encoded with the letter A. Same goes with temperate and date. They are encoded with the letter B. In summary, the rhyme scheme of the poem is A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D. We have shines, declines for C, dim, and untrimmed. For D, we have EF, EF, fade and shade for E, O's and girls for F. And lastly, we have there C and V for letter G. The second approach that we can use in critiquing a literary selection is what we call the moralistic or philosophical approach. Now, this becomes more serious than the structuralist approach where wherein you need to look into the structure of a literary selection with the moralistic or philosophical view or approach we need to analyze the selection with a deeper sense of responsibility so we try to look into the actions, the minds, and also the perspectives of the characters. Things that we usually ask whenever we critic a literary selection using the moralistic approach would be, what are ideas contained in the work? How do these ideas reflect moral and ethical principles? How may the ideas be evaluated intellectually or morally? Does the text seek to corrupt or negatively influence the reader? How so or why? What moral or ethical teaching is the author presenting in the text or through character, plot, or theme? How do characters, settings, and plot events represent moral or ethical principles? Does the work in question pose a pragmatic or morals or philosophical idea?
Let us listen to a story, The Rat Trap. The Rat Trap A rat looked through the crack in the wall to see the farmer and his wife opening a package. What food might it contain? He was aghast to discover that it was a rat trap. Retreating to the barnyard, the rat proclaimed a warning. There's a rat trap in the house! A rat trap in the house! The chicken clock and scratch raised her head and said, Excuse me, Mr. Rat, I can tell this is a grave concern to you, but it is of no consequence to me. I cannot be bothered by it. The rat turned to the pig and told him, There's a rat trap in the house, a rat trap in the house. I am so very sorry, Mr. Rat, sympathized the pig. But there is nothing I can do about it but pray. Be assured that you are in my prayers. The rat turned to the cow. She said, Like wow, Mr. Rat, a rat trap? Uh, I, I am in grave danger, duh. So the rat returned to the house. Head down and dejected, to face the farmer's rat trap alone. That very night, a sound was heard throughout the house, like the sound of a rat trap catching its prey. The farmer's wife rushed to see what was caught. In the darkness, she did not see that it was a venomous snake whose tail the trap had caught. The snake bit the farmer's wife. The farmer rushed her to the hospital. She returned home with a fever. Now, everyone knows that you treat a fever with fresh chicken soup. So, the farmer took his hachet to the barnyard for the soup's main ingredient. His wife's sickness continued so that friends and neighbors came to sit with her around the clock. To feed them, the farmer butchered the pig. The farmer's wife did not get well. She died, and so many people came for her funeral that the farmer had the cow slaughtered to provide meat for all of them to eat. Now, what did you learn from the story? Is there a part of the story that he would like to change? For the woman not to get sick, for the chicken not to be Killed to be the soup's main ingredient, for the pig not to be butchered by the farmer to feed their friends and neighbors who came to sit with a sick lady? Or would you change a part of the story for the woman or the farmer's wife not to die and so there wouldn't be a need for the cow to be slaughtered to provide meat for all of the visitors to eat? What part of the story would you like to change? I tried answering some of the questions that I presented earlier. Those questions will be your guide on how to critic a literary selection using the moralistic or philosophical approach. The first question that we have there, what are the ideas contained in the work The Rat Trap? It could be expressing sympathy and empathy to others. Second, looking into other people's situation before forming judgment. The next guide question that we have is, how do ideas or the ideas reflected in the story make us realize the ethical and moral principles? First answer there, first possible answer is, people should care more about each other's welfare. Second is, our thoughts and ideas can affect others in some ways. Let's have our third guide question. There we have, does the text seek to corrupt or negatively influence the reader? How so and or why? I don't think the text influenced the readers in a negative way. It actually influenced the readers to be more prudent, wise, or judicious. Our words, our decisions, and our actions definitely affect the people around us, especially the people we hold dear to our hearts. 
Lastly, you can have the other guide questions ready when you need to critic a literary selection using this moralistic or philosophical approach. Dear students, we are now ready to start with the activity. So get your phones or have your laptops or desktops ready and open in your Nearpod application or go to www.nearpod.com and enter the code in uppercase, A-N-J-U-3. And then we're ready to start the lesson. For activity A, the main instruction here is to label the rhyme scheme pattern accordingly. This is a very easy activity for you to start off and be good in the succeeding activity. So let's start. Please start reading. This is a sample quatrain or a four line stanza that I already answered for my students. Let's start reading each line. Sonnet 116 by William Shakespeare. Let me not to the marriage of true minds. That's A. Admit impediments. Love is not love. B. Which alters when it alteration finds. That's A. Minds and finds rhyme. So we both have A in those lines or bends with a remover to remove. That's B. We have love on the second line and remove on the fourth line. So we have B because the two words on the last part of each line rhymes. Now, this is what you need to answer. I hope you're ready and you're looking at the presentation in your Nearpad application. Let's start. Oh, no, it is an ever fixed mark. The answer there is. Okay, you can actually answer it using your uh, Nearpod application. I can open in the whiteboard for you. The answer there is, let's click a pen. I already chose a color and let's start writing. So that is C. Okay, let's go back. That looks on Tempest and is never shaken. Let's open the whiteboard. We can type in the letter. You can write it using the pencil. You can also type it in or move your answer close to the first answer. Let's close it for a bit and go back to the main activity. It is the start to every wandering bark that rhymes with mark, the last word on the first line. So what do you think should be the answer there? Let's write our answer. Let's type it in. So it's C and move it closer or under D. Yeah, you can always do a lot of things here using our whiteboard. Whose words unknown, although his height be taken. Taken, the last word on the fourth line rhymes with the last word on the second line, which is Shaken. We have shaken and taken. Let's open the whiteboard and let's try writing in our answer using our pen in here. Let's try using a different color. And that is D. 
So there we have the rhyme scheme C, D, C, D. Let's close the whiteboard for a while and go back. Let's look at the next. Let's try our collaborate board. Okay, got it. For this collaborate board, you can type in some of your thoughts. If you're having some difficulties or if you want to ask follow-up questions on why should we answer that way, why did we answer C instead of the other letter, why did we consider that a rhyme scheme, you can share your thoughts or some images of your answer there. If you have written your answer on a paper, you can take a picture of your answer and send it to me. I can see it here in our Collaborate board. Just upload the file or images using your Nearpod application, and then we can easily share our thoughts about the lesson. And you can post it in there. Oh, I can see one answer in here. I just need to check it and approve it. I'll just I'll just click check and your answer can also be seen by other students. Good point, Andy. Let's proceed to the other parts of the activity. So we'll we'll just continue activity A with this. A stanza loves not times full do rosy lips and cheeks that would be hmm let's think carefully of the answer i can open the whiteboard read the other parts of the previous activity let's type in our answer for the line that i've read the answer there is e so we're done with A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D. If you close the whiteboard, you will see that the word cheeks doesn't rhyme with the previous words that we had in the other stanzas. So we have mark, shaken, minds, and love. And those words don't rhyme with the word cheeks so we have there a new letter which is e let's check on the next line within his bending sickles compass com that is letter it's also different with cheeks it sounds different with cheeks so we can add in another letter oh let me have green this time so i'll be typing in f so earlier we had E, click enter, and F. Okay, close the whiteboard for a while and read the next line. Love alters not with its brief hours and weeks. Hmm, weeks rhymes with cheeks. Okay, so that would be E. Let's continue answering this. I think I click on the dot mark, so I wouldn't be needing the dot mark again. I just need this letter. Let's erase everything. Delete everything that I have here and type in the answer from the start. So I had answered E and F and E. Okay, we are now on the fourth line. Fourth line there is but bears it out even to the edge of do. Doom rhymes with the second, the last word on the second line, which is calm, and then we have doom. Let's open the whiteboard again, or dots in there, so I just need to delete those. Okay. We have, if this be terror and upon me proof, I never read nor no man ever love. Proof and love, those two words rhyme. So we can put in here B. So that's it. We already have our complete answers 
for activity A. Let's close the whiteboard and have a recap of our answers. We have A, B, A, B. That's the rhyme scheme for the first answer. We have C, D, C, D. We have E, F, E, F, and G, G.